I'm glad you're here to worship today. I'm glad you're here to connect with God and one another. I'm Pastor Hans. I'm glad you're here for worship. Now, a few things. We will be having communion at the end of service, so get your communion cups ready. We'll be having that, a blessed time for communion after. Before we get there, we turn to worship now. Let's pray together, hear the words together, sing together, and connect our hearts to God. Let's gather for worship now. In the name of God, the Creator, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. All of our sins are forgiven by God Almighty in the name of the Creator and of the Son and of the Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. I invite you to share that peace in a different way, maybe through a text message to somebody or an email or a nudge on Facebook, but let them know you're thinking about them. Oh
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. What's in the bag? Yeah, what's in the bag? What's in the bag? Yeah, what's in the bag? I don't know. What's in the bag? Bum bum. I'm Pastor Hans. I'm Uncle Pastor Wes. Uncle Pastor Arya. And we're here. So what's in the pastor's bag today? Hmm. Mm. Maybe uh, it's a book. Board game? It says a book. Arya says book. It is a book. Not just any book. Cub Scout. That's your, this is Wes's Wolf Den Cub Scout book. Mm -hmm. On the back is the Scout, Scout Oath and Scout Law. Yep. And inside all kinds of fun stuff, huh? You get to learn. You get to do things. Wow, I like it. Ooh, I yes. do too. This is about the mint, how they make money. Ooh, can I Ooh, need this? right there, yeah. Ooh. This is about pause on the path. This is about going on a hike and keeping you all safe. Ooh, this is fun. This is about campfire. Yeah. Going camping. So there's all kinds of fun stuff in the Cub Scout handbook. Mm -hmm. You can hold that look at. So why do we do Cub Scouts, Wes? To learn? I, I, I to know, learn, yes. I know what you think of a, a paper airplane. It even makes you how to teach you how to make a paper airplane. That's amazing. Yeah. Hey, Arya, do you have fun at Scouts or is it like a chore that you don't want to do? Do you have fun at Cup Scouts? Um, the, the only thing you do is do chores there and have fun. You don't do chores at Cup Scouts. <laughs> what are you talking about? You have fun. You do fun activities. We went on a hike the other weekend. There was a camp out. There was all kinds of fun stuff. Fun. And Miss Linda taught Wes's Cub Scout Den about being part of the Osage Nation. So that was really fun. And so all kinds of stuff we do. And so Cub Scout teaches and it has fun and it raises the next generation. Hey, guys, want to know something? Mm -hmm. What? I was in Cub Scout when I was your age. <gasps> I was in Cub Scout. Oh, I know. So the great wait, about wait, were you in Cub Scouts when you were my age? I was. And was it safe? Yes, I was. <gasps> so... It's a lot of fun. So I had a lot of fun. I learned lots of stuff. So I wanted you two to have lots of fun and you two learn about stuff too, right? Yes. Yes. And so I want you all to have Cub Scouts. So it's important to raise the next generation. Mm -hmm. And same with the church, right? You go to church to learn yeah. and have fun. Mm -hmm. And you can because I went to church when I was a kid and we take you to church so that you learn about church and God yes. and have faith and you get to do all kinds of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And you also learn about religion. That is religion, faith in God. That's all about religion. So, we learn about all these things. So, we go to church, kind of like Cup Scouts, to have fun and learn and raise up the next generation. So, they do good as well. Ooh. Good things. Okay, right, let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. How amazing are you? How amazing are you? Help us to learn. Help us to learn. Help us to have fun. Help us to have fun. Help us to grow. Help us to grow. In faith. In faith. And knowledge. And knowledge. And in truth. And in truth. Help all the kids. Help all the kids. To grow also. To grow also. We love you, God. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye. Bye. The first reading is from Acts, 17th chapter. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas off to Beroea, and when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. These Jews were more receptive than those in Thessalonica, for they welcomed the message very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see whether these things were so. But many of them therefore believed, including not a few Greek women and men of high standing. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Boreoia as well, they came there too to stir up and incite the crowds. Then the believers immediately sent Paul away to the coast, but Silas and Timothy remained behind. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions to have Silas and Timothy join him as soon as possible, they left him. The Word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. The Psalm of the Day is Psalm 16, verses 1 through 7. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. The second reading is from Acts, the 18th chapter. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ from Mark, the 13th chapter. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nations will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Something comes up again and again in Bible study, and it's the centrality of the city of Jerusalem. We can't get around this. Jerusalem is the holy city of God, the city of David. This is where the temple was. That's where Jerusalem was. That was the heart of all that was Judaism. We can't get around it. And so whenever we study the Old Testament, even the New Testament, this comes up time and time again. When people ask about forgiveness, when we talk about sins, when we talk about Jewish religion, it is Jerusalem only Jerusalem, because the temple was there. And only the temple could sacrifices be done to cleanse the people. The people, whatever their sin was, whatever their issue was, 
To get forgiveness, they had to do sacrifices. And so they bring animals, they bring cakes of barley and wheat, and they would burn them. Now, some of the meat they get to eat, but this was a sacrificial system set up by God, given to Moses, and then divinely inspired and put in place in the temple as God commanded. And so this was the place. You can't get around it. And so when the disciples come in Jerusalem, they talk to Jesus and they say, Jesus, ooh, look, oh, look at the big stone. Look at the temple, look how great this place is. And Jesus is like, meh. Like, but Jesus, look, the temple is here, the sacrifice is here, how grand this is, how great this temple. And Jesus' response is, meh. It's kind of funny, we heard that in the gospel reading today. And Jesus flips it around. The disciples are talking about how great the temple is, how great this building is, but Jesus says, destroy it in three days, I will raise it up. Now, of course, he's talking about himself, the body of Christ. Now, this obviously was going against much of Judaism at the time. But Jesus is correct. Jesus knows that the temple will be destroyed. The Romans will do this in 70 AD, and it will be complete. But here's the thing. When this happens, Judaism had to spread out. Now, there are already synagogues and other places. There were people worshiping. There are Jews in the diaspora spread all over the world at the time, from India up to England. There were Jews all over the place, Spain, North Africa, Egypt. But it had to get there. So how do we get there? How do we get from Jerusalem being the one city, the one place where sacrifices could happen to all over the world? Well, it's not by free delivery. I've been thinking a lot about that lately because it's Christmas time soon. We're thinking about presents. We're thinking about the Amazon wish list. We think about Target wish list, the Walmart wish list. We think about all these things to get people. And we often hear free delivery. There's really no such thing as free delivery. Somebody has to pay that. The postal service, UPS, they got to get paid. And so I'm always kind of skeptical. Well, how are they paying for this? Well, it comes out from the business revenue. And so when you buy enough stuff, they say, oh, free shipping. What they're really saying is you pay enough stuff, you buy enough stuff, we cover the cost because we really want to get you because you spent enough money. So how did God have it delivered? Well, it wasn't free delivery. It wasn't Amazon or UPS or the Postal Service or FedEx. It was by people. God chose the apostles, the disciples, to carry the message on. So either by boat or by walking, the disciples, the apostles, carried the message to the ends of the earth. When we talk about the series on Acts, we think about the first half was centered in Jerusalem. The first half of Acts is based in that city, and it was with Peter and some of those other first disciples. But then the second half of Acts is spread out. It's that delivery to the rest of the world. That second half of Acts we'll be hearing about today and tomorrow or next week. And in this series on Acts we'll be hearing, it's really about Paul. Now, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Saul, Paul and Apollos, Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, but Paul's always in that mix there. So the first part of Acts is in Jerusalem, that holy city, where Jesus is like, meh. And then the second half of Acts is spreading out that free delivery to all the ends of the earth. I love that. The story of Acts spreads out throughout. Now, it will be easy to make this into a great saint tale. We had All Saints last week. I was thinking about that still. And there's a whole category of writing called hagiography. Hagiography is a saint story. I mean, the literal word means the study of the saints. And there are books written about the saints, the great saints, the desert fathers and mothers, St. Francis, St. Anthony. Even Buddhism has these hagiography, these saint writings about the Buddha. Islam has it. Hinduism has it. Many of the world's religions have these books. They're stories of the saints going out and spreading the whatever their gospel is. We're spreading the good news about the religion. And what's amazing is so many of these saint tales have some things in common. The first thing is miraculous powers, miracles, healings, all these great things, miraculous powers. The second thing is great success. They go above and beyond. And so these things happen, the spreading of the thing. And the third thing they have is the great faith of the saint. So here's the thing, though, about hagiographies. They go above and beyond. They are ridiculous. They are crazy big about these things. The saints do these great miracles, these great healings. Buddha goes to these great kings and rulers, and Buddha talks to the ruler for like five minutes, and the ruler's like, oh, you're so wise. We're all Buddhists now. What's interesting is all these hagiographies, all these writings of the saints, whether it be Buddha or St. Francis or these other saints, happen much after the event. The stories grow. 
The stories get larger and larger and larger. The stories are written much later, hundreds, hundreds of years later. But the book of Acts is different. First, it's not over the top, and we'll get into that. The second thing is it's actually not written hundreds of years later. The book of Acts was written when Paul got to Rome, and we'll hear about that next week. This book ends with Paul in Rome, and we don't know the fates. So church history says what it is. We know what it is by church history. But the book of Acts ends kind of abruptly. And that's because Luke, who's writing this, is with Paul, and he ends up in Rome, and he's writing this, and he writes it before the story's done. Now, he couldn't keep on writing forever. You can't do that because then you're just writing and writing and writing every day. And so he wrote up to the Gospel of Luke and then Acts. And so he's writing right when Paul gets to Rome. So it's not hundreds of years, but it's actually in the moment. Also, the book of Acts is not over the top. Now, what's there are some miracles. Absolutely, there's some great things. There are miracles, there's healings, there are people being raised from the dead. Great stuff. But it's not over the top. It's not so ridiculous that people go, oh, that can't be oil. It was exaggerated hundreds of years later. The funny thing about it is it's actually much more realistic. The book of Acts really does portray the start of the church, the spread of the church. But unlike the hagiography about the Buddha where he goes and talks to a king and instantly everyone's converted, we don't have that in the book of Acts. There's times where they struggle. They struggle in a mighty way. And so in a great thing, these writers, these people who are going up, who Luke is with Paul and many of these where he says, we, there's a little pronoun change in the book of Acts. He sees what's going on. And it's a great thing. They, they have some progress and then they fail. They go one step forward, one step back. Two step forwards, one step back. In our first reading today, we hear about Paul and Silas going to from Thessalonica to another Greek city. And he goes because... In Thessalonica, he's chased out by the Jewish people of the synagogue. They don't like what he's saying. He's heretical, they think. He's blasphemous. How dare you say that God raised up this Jesus from the dead? And how dare you say that he is God's son? Judaism doesn't work that way, they say. And Paul says, no, no, no. He tries to preach. He's trying to explain to them. And they're like, nope, we're done. Get out. If you don't get out, we're going to kill you. And so he escapes in the middle of the night. This happens a couple times. Paul is really good at escaping in the middle of the night. And so he goes to the next Greek town, we heard in the first reading today, and he's there and the synagogue actually goes, wow, this is good stuff. And so Paul and Silas are teaching and preaching and, they're, and it's great because they say they study the scriptures. So they actually go through and see what does the scriptures actually say? And they study and they find out, wow, Paul knows his scriptures. And yes, this actually makes sense. This Messiah, this Christ figure was foretold. This Christ figure had these hints here and there and it fulfills the covenant in a great way. Now, it doesn't matter because like every, like two steps forward, one step back. And so even though the synagogue there actually embraces the teaching, the Jewish leaders from Thessalonica come in and they start causing trouble again and they're going to kill Paul again. And so he has to flee in the middle of the night again. We hear this over and over again for like every time there's success, there's a regression. Every two steps forward, one step back. But it's interesting because by this, the missionary journeys go from this town to that town to the other and around. And so Paul will stay in one place. Paul and Barnabas will stay in one place as long as they can until they're chased off either by the Romans, the local pagan authorities, or by the Jewish synagogue leaders. So we see this pattern. It's kind of interesting. So this is not like the great saint stories where every town the Buddha went to, everybody instantly became Buddhist and everyone instantly converted. It's not like those stories. And there are plenty of stories like that in Christianity. Oh, this great saint went here and everything changed. I've been reading a few books from my doctor of ministry and they're written by pastors of very large churches. And it's kind of that way like, oh, I went to this, I started this church and within a year we had a thousand members and five years later we had 3,000 members. And this like these great saint stories of, oh, this great thing happened. Everybody changed, converted. But the book of Acts is not like that. For every step forward or two steps forward, they take a step back. For every town that welcomes them, eventually they get chased off or another group chases them away. But along the way, they bring on new disciples. We heard in the second retreat about Apollos. He's educated, he's articulate, he's of Greek origin, but he also knows the scriptures. And he's mentored, not by Paul, but by Priscilla and Aquila, this husband-wife duo who are strong in the faith, probably as strong in the faith as Paul is. 
and they're educated, they're very passionate, they are hardworking people, and they raise up the next generation. And even Paul, he's traveling with Silas and Timothy on this journey. And so every time they go somewhere, they bring on new disciples, they bring on in somebody else to mentor, to train, to educate, to instruct, to disciple for the next generation. Even if they have to leave that town eventually, there's still a disciple there. That's one of the growth of the church, that no matter where we go, no matter where we're spreading, we're still raising up new disciples, new leaders every single step of the way. And that's really key. That's really crucial in the story of Acts. The story of Acts is about the mission of God going out and every place it goes, there's a new disciple or a couple or a family or even a part of the synagogue or town. And so it grows. It's not perfect linear growth, by the way. It's not exponential growth like we might assume it would be. It's the start, stop, herky-jerky, two-step forward, one-step back kind of thing. But this gives me hope because right now we need to hear this. The church always makes progress. The church is progressing on. The mission of the church keeps moving on. Even though there are times where it feels like we take a step back or two steps back, even though we may be deterred or discouraged. And right now we need to hear that. And that's why I appreciate about when I was reading through the book of Acts, preparing for the sermon series, I thought that's really helpful because there's times where we think about the church and we think it's not what we want to be. Yes, the church is not perfect. And in our world right now, it's not what we want. We are hoping and praying that we can get back in service for Christmas Eve. We are praying that everyone will be safe and healthy. But we can't have it like we had it before. And it's not what we may want it to be today. And that's quite discouraging. It's hard because the church is not what we even were two or three years ago. But here's the thing. The book of Acts shows us this. We keep making progress. We keep moving forward. The mission of the church keeps moving on one step at a time, two steps, three steps, maybe a step back. And I feel like in many ways, yes, we've taken a step back in our culture. Everybody has. Schools, hospitals, every institution has had this issue. We've been facing with COVID and everything. But through it all, we take another step forward. We keep making progress. It's not the linear exponential growth we may want it to be or think about, but we're making progress. We're going forward. Even though we've taken a step back, the book of Acts shows us you take another step forward. The mission continues. The Holy Spirit is pushing us one step at a time. Not the linear progression we like, but the mission continues. The mission thrives, the mission grows, the mission continues on one step at a time. So even though it's not been a great time for our country and the world, even though it's been tough, we still make progress. The Holy Spirit is with us, the church is moving. The movement of God cannot be stopped. Though at times it feels and looks like we take a step back, that's okay because we are still moving forward, making progress. The mission of the church keeps moving on. Let us move on in the Holy Spirit, making progress every day. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Eternal God, you hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in need. God, our creator, you show us the path of life. Bless faithful people everywhere with humility as they extend compassion to those who have experienced harm in religious spaces. Cultivate healthy congregations that tell of and enact your reconciling love. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our constant, you love our universe from beginning to end. As the seasons change, protect animals that migrate and hibernate. Bring them to safety, to a sheltered place, and a more abundant season. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our ruler, you write your law on human minds and hearts. Give wisdom to all elected leaders and officials to govern with insight and compassion. Make them mindful of the well-being of all people so that your world will flourish. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our guide, you are greater than we can imagine. Surround congregations with your expansive inclusion. Be present in the midst of disagreements, differences, and questions. Unite people of diverse viewpoints in the love of God. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our beginning and our end, your beloved people shine like the brightness of the sky. We thank you for the lives of all who rest in your eternal mercy, from famous saints to the people we have loved. Assure us of your resurrection promise. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our hope and strength, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, good in all times, all places. Give thanks and praise to you, merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, who after his resurrection sent forth the apostles to preach the gospel to teach all nations and promised to be with them and be to the end of the age. And so, with all the glorious company of the apostles, with the choirs of angels, the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, you alone are holy, you alone are God. We give you thanks for your Son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We thank you, O God. In the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, giving disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, gave disciples saying, take and drink. This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the member to me. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit and our gathering within this meal among your people throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, in your church, without end. Amen. Lord, remember your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is set. Come, taste, and see that God is good. Amen. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand.
Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. We're glad you're here Sunday morning or anytime during the week you find time to connect to God as the church. Now, a few announcements for you. First, we'll be having our community Thanksgiving service on Saturday, November 20th at 6 p.m. at the LDS Church. I'll be there. There will also be a Zoom link. So if you'd like to watch online, we'll be having a Zoom link for that for the community Thanksgiving service. It's put on by the Minister Alliance. So we'll have about 10, 11 churches participate in the church. A great time in person and on Zoom for that if you want to participate those ways. Also, we'll have an envelope around in the church if you want to give a gift for that or for the Minister Alliance. Please mark your gift for Minister Alliance. The Minister Alliance Liaison is a great opportunity we connect with. We're one of the charter members, our church, and so we support the ministry of that. Also coming up, it's a busy time, Thanksgiving. So we'll be having the Thanksgiving meal here for one good meal on Thanksgiving Day, that Thursday. So if you'd like to participate, we are providing mashed potatoes and gravy this year. Our church will be providing mashed potatoes and gravy. If you'd like to participate, let the church know, let me know, contact church office, myself. Let us know if you're able to bring mashed potatoes or gravy so we can know how much to make. So we need 150 servings of mashed potatoes and gravy for that day. So thank you all for being here. We hope you have a blessed week. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.